Hello, and welcome to week four, Nursing 103, uh, Chapter 77, Musculoskeletal Disorders. I do apologize, I am running about a day behind getting these videos out. Uh, however, we have gotten things uh, reasonably, um, reasonably figured out. Uh, as you all may notice, uh, Shadow Health uh, has landed, and woo-ha! So we are on track and hey, great news, week five, according to your student outlines, which if you do not recall, uh, you will find in week one of the e-supplement for Nursing 103, week five, there is no homework. Um, so you will have this to, uh, this to watch and rewatch. Uh, we do have a uh, quiz tomorrow. Um, which will be opened up for a, a good long time. And you know, next week, uh, you should be getting some study guides out from your instructors uh, for the midterm, which uh, is happening in week six. Um, again, refer to your student outlines in all of your classes to help you stay on track. They'll be in uh, week one of each one of your classes. Without further ado, Let's look at chapter 77. There it is. And come on, there we go. Computer's arguing with me. Okay, chapter 77, musculoskeletal disorders. Excellent. Well, not if you have one, I guess. So, first off, orthopedics. I have a special spot in my heart for, uh, for orthopedics. Uh, my wife is a um, certified ortho nurse. Um, I have been an end user of orthopedic uh, services a few times in my life. Um, but this is the medical specialty that treats diseases and injuries of the musculoskeletal system. So muscles and bones. Um, ortho nurses uh, are a wonderful breed. Uh, you can definitely see the difference between ortho nurses and uh, critical care nurses. Orthopedics, their patients are in a lot of pain and do a lot of bleeding where critical care we don't dispense the uh, the pain meds uh, as they do in orthopedics because our patients generally are not hurting that bad and we like them to keep breathing um, the joke around our house for uh, quite a long time was uh, when they have a serious orthopedic injury they would uh, go see my wife to get adequately medicated for pain and then they'd come over to see me to remember how to breathe um, always always fun so diagnostics, all right, obviously with bones, we're looking at x-rays, okay. Um, MRI, CT, those are, uh, those are better when you are looking at, um, when you're looking at soft tissue like muscle, but uh, x-rays are dense and, uh, or x-rays, bones are dense uh, and that's where the x-rays really show up. Or really pick up um, pulling in from your uh, from your medical terminology an arthrogram so a gram would be a picture or a record of um, so you've got the arthrogram myelogram um, and then CT uh, another type of, uh, of radiography um, which uh, is different looks at uh, different tissues uh, different densities um, MRIs, bone scans, uh, do, you may see someone getting a bone scan uh, if they have a bone density issue such as osteoporosis, cancers, uh, just trying to figure out what's going on with that patient. Um, arthrocentesis, uh, so this would be in with a joint, centesis, removal of fluid, so this is pulling fluid uh, directly off the joint. Arthroscopy, again, arthro, 
joint and then uh, scopey. Um, that's where you're uh, viewing with the with the camera versus uh, direct observation. Uh, biopsy um, and electromyogram, uh, where you're looking at the uh, the electric or how muscles uh, react to electrical stimulus, and you're also then looking at the electrical lead. Uh, the electrical activity within the muscle itself. We are, uh, we're actually a pretty amazing machine. Uh, we have structural, um, we have fluid, um, we have heating and cooling systems. Uh, when they say, uh, if you've ever heard the term, my body's a temple, uh, mine's more like a tar paper shack, but uh, you get the idea. Um, all these pieces, uh, uh, these systems, they are systems, mechanical, electrical systems um, that can wear down or break. And when they wear down or break, that's where we come in. So what do you think? True or false? Metallic implants eligible for MRI scanning. All right, so MRI magnetic resonance imaging. Uh, would you think? that someone who has metal in their body. And this could play in as well more than just metallic, you know, intended metallic implants like plates on bones uh, or screws placed, pins say uh, in old brakes. Uh, but uh, older bets um, with uh, shrapnel injuries, uh, potential for a piece of metal still inside the body. Um, would these patients be eligible for an MRI. If you said false, you would be correct. Orthopedic screws, um, damage and death if it if because that is a very very strong magnet that is being used um, can try to pull these uh, pieces loose. Uh, I had an MRI done of my knee years ago, and uh, they had to X-ray my head because of my service uh, and the fact that I uh, was uh, working with a lot of metal grinding and all that. They had to x-ray my head to make sure that there were no pieces of metal in and around my eyes before I went in and had the, um, the MRI. Um, so they x-rayed my head, didn't find a thing. Oh, hmm, nursing process. I think we've seen this before, maybe something. So we're collecting data or assessing, uh, making our nursing diagnosis off of that. Then we have the planning and implementation and evaluation. Did it work? So and pi, I'll, everything and pi. Um, speaking of pi, I have little pies right here. Um, I know, random, sorry. <clears throat> so data collection does your patient have an immobilization device so are they wearing a brace do they have a splint or a cast on uh, very important to assess in and around these devices because they can cause pressure and when the device causes pressure it impairs the blood flow to the skin and to the tissues underneath and if that blood flow is impaired, that tissue dies. And then you have, going back to 40, 41, and 42, you have an open wound. And then an open wound is a portal for infection. So you didn't check the uh, splint or the, uh, the brace. Patient had an open wound, got an infection, got sepsis, and died. It can be, uh, it can travel along just like that from such a simple thing as not assessing the skin under the brace, the splint. Um, as well, if it is putting pressure, it can impair the blood flow to the area of the body distal to where that brace was. So let's say I've got an arm, I have an arm obviously, uh, and I have a brace that goes from my elbow around through here. 
and it is too tight and it impairs the blood flow. All of this, my brace is here, all of this down here now uh, is not getting proper blood flow, that tissue can die. If you have a patient with a brace or a splint, <clears throat> one of the critical points besides the skin underneath the brace or the splint is to assess blood flow distal, meaning away from the, away from the center line, but distal to the brace or the splint. Um, so that I don't fix my broken arm, but then lose the hand. That make sense? Uh, planning Im implementation, disorders of immobility. Okay, so when we think disorders of immobility, probably the first thing that comes up is pressure. Uh, we turn our patients uh, who are at risk, uh, who cannot turn themselves or move themselves easily and they're at risk for skin breakdown. We turn them every uh, two hours uh, to relieve pressure over bony prominences to re make sure that that blood flow is restored so that they don't develop a PRI, a pressure-related injury, what we used to call a bed sore or a decubitus ulcer, right? These pressure-related injuries. Um, and that's the one that comes most commonly to mind when you think of a disorder of immobility. Um, I want you to think deeper on this. Um, we will be uh, starting in, in week six. We jump into respiratory. One of the disorders of immobility that you need to be very aware of is the potential for the patient to develop uh, breathing difficulties or pneumonia. Uh, because if the patient is not up and moving around and more active, they tend to breathe shallower, right? Not breathing as deeply. They're not clearing secretions, and those secretions can build up in the lungs makes a nice yummy bit of mucus for our old friends, the bacteria. And what happens when we have a bloom of bacteria in the lungs? What would we call that? If you said pneumonia, you were right on track. Pneumonia is a disorder of immobility. Another disorder of immobility that you don't necessarily think of right off the top would be constipation. Um, now I'm going to introduce you to a concept now that uh, you'll want to follow through through the rest of your time at IOT and uh, when you're out in the field working as nurses. Right? Constipation. The absolute best way to treat constipation is to prevent it. Three simple, easy, best ways to prevent constipation. Fluids, adequate fluids. Um, the majority of water reabsorption happens in the large intestine, um, which is also where you'd be uh, with that water being reabsorbed if the patient does not have enough fluids going through their GI tract then uh, the fecal matter becomes thicker, harder, and much harder to pass. The patient becomes constipated. Okay, there's one. Two is fiber. So dietary. So push fluids, push fiber. And number three is exercise. We're not talking preparing for a marathon here. We're talking getting up and moving around. If the patient can't move around because they've been immobile, they run a higher risk for developing constipation. So prevention of constipation, those three things, fluids, fiber, exercise. Uh, some will, uh, will say, hey, but what about stool softeners? Stool softeners may be a piece of this, but your best absolute no medications whatsoever because every medication that you give, including oxygen, may have a side effect. All right? 
no side effects, fluids, fiber, exercise. Those three pieces right there uh, to prevent constipation, which leads me to the larger concept as we're coming into this. And again, something for you to lock into your brains. Normally, if I was in class, I would stomp my foot on the floor uh, three times, but uh, if I do that now, I'm going to freak the dog out. So, the absolute best treatment for any condition, if it's cancer, if it's constipation, heart disease, the absolute best treatment is, wait for it, prevention. Don't get the disease in the first place. Best treatment for the flu, get your flu shot, don't get the flu, right? Or stay away from people who have the flu or who might have the flu. Um, okay, currently why I'm sitting in my living room in front of a bookcase uh, staring into a laptop teaching you about, uh, about musculoskeletal disorders, prevention. I do not want the Rona. Don't want the coronavirus, um, and this is prevention. Social, social isolation, yeah. Social distancing, again, prevention. Best treatment, prevention. Okay. So continuing on with our planning and implementation for musculoskeletal disorders, provide comfortable positioning, proper alignment, and skin care. Okay, skin care, that makes sense, right? We're trying to make sure that the skin does not break down, get an open wound, and increase the likelihood that your patient will develop an infection, stay longer in the hospital, and probably die. Okay? Um, proper alignment. Think back. Uh, to some point where you have just sat in a funny position or you woke up feeling like someone had beaten you to death because you slept wrong. You slept in a weird position. Okay, Again, proper alignment um, leads to uh, better uh, physical well-being. Okay? Comfortable positioning. This makes sense. We're caring for the patient. Um, it also uh, can reduce the number of times you are called in to that patient if they're comfortable. And if you're out there working, you've got six, eight, ten other, uh, other patients who are vying for your attention. If it is something as simple as providing comfortable positioning for that patient to allow you more time to care for everyone, then Comfortable positioning makes sense, yeah? Adequate nutrition. Now, when we say adequate nutrition, um, we're not talking wheelbarrows full of food, okay? Your nutritional needs change with your activity level. So say my patient has a musculoskeletal condition, uh, they've got a fractured femur, and they're not going to be up and walking and moving around um, or uh, jogging their 10 miles every uh, every other morning, whatever it is that happens to be running their marathon. Um, does that patient still require the same tonnage of uh, food that they would? Okay, tonnage, that was a little smarky, snarky, but... Uh, you know, do they require the same amount of food when they are immobile as when they're up and active? Um, the answer is no. Uh, the nutrition should be um, should be commensurate with their activity level, because we don't. One thing we want to do when treating a patient who has uh, has been immobilized uh, or who is uh, recovering from a musculoskeletal injury or condition. We want to give them the most, um, the best chance of returning to their baseline function. 
So if a patient has a musculoskeletal injury and while they are laid up, they gain 20 pounds because they're still eating like a marathon runner, um, but they're not moving off the bed other, other than to uh, you know, go to the bedside commode or be assisted to the bathroom. Maintaining that normal level of uh, nutritional intake can be a problem. They require sufficient nutrition to meet their body's metabolic needs, but we don't want to feed them up so much that uh, once they have recovered from the injury, then they have to recover from the weight gain that's happened while they've been down. I that, hope that makes sense, sir. Activity and exercise. Okay, so we've already gone over why we would want to promote activity. Activity and exercises does not mean that they have to be doing push-ups or sit-ups or, you know, jogging. It may be as simple as assisting them to walk to get that exercise and activity. It may be a case of uh, providing passive range of motion or um, walking them through active range of motion to maintain flexibility in the joints. It can, it can be as simple as that. And then our evaluation, did it work? Um, did the patient uh, recover? Are they healing well? Uh, did they develop pneumonia? Um, did they get constipated? Uh, did they gain 30 pounds? Um, not necessarily would it be the case that we want them to lose a, a lot of weight depending on where they're at when they start. Um, I will take a, this moment again to say as you're getting into this, you're beginning to see that um, the math that we do at the bedside, those are the last absolute black and white answers in nursing. Everything else depends totally on the patient, right? What their condition is at that time. Um, the, as I say, that. There's no more black and white answers after the math. It all depends on what your assessment uh, and your nursing diagnosis come up with and what is going on with that patient at that time. So evaluation, did it work? And that rolls us back into data collection because we don't just go through this process once when caring for a patient. This is a constant cycle that we're doing over and over and over again while we're caring for this patient. Pressure, oh yeah. So we already started to talk about that with the with the brace, right? So pressure can cause edema, uh, especially distal to the area of pressure, as blood may be getting in. Oh, that's a sneeze. But it's not getting. <laughs> hmm. Pardon me. Um, Everything is in bloom outside my house right now. <clears throat> so blood's getting in, but the return is being, uh, is being impaired, which can cause elevated pressure in the vasculature, which can cause water to be forced out of the bloodstream and into surrounding tissue. And when we have uh, fluid collections in surrounding tissue, we call that edema. Skin color. Uh, pressure can cause uh, uh, skin color changes. If I have a pressure point here and that pressure uh, continues and continues and it's cutting off the arterial blood flow or restricting the arterial blood flow, I'm going to see my hand start to get pale. And it will also get cooler because that hot blood is not going through there to warm, uh, to warm the digits. Um, the same can be said for something that is just impairing the venous return. Blood's coming in, but it's being, it's, uh, the outflow is being impaired and I can see redness or purplish color. Um, in cases where there has been pressure, uh, prolonged pressure on a spot, 
I may have a reddened area that when I touch it, doesn't blanch out anymore, it doesn't turn white, um, and that is the beginning of a pressure-related injury. Right. Severe pain. Um, if you have ever had something cramped on so tight that it's cut off the blood flow to an area, uh, then you know the feeling. Uh, I'm not going to recommend that you tie a tourniquet around yourself uh, just to experience it, uh, but if you ever have, then you know what this pain is. Uh, if you haven't, trust me, it hurts. The lack of the distal pulse. So if I have pressure on an area and I have cut down uh, on my blood flow to that area, then the pulses distal to the side of the pressure are going to become weaker or they're not going to be able to be felt, oddly enough, because there's no blood flow getting through there. And then slow capillary refill, again, distal to the site of the pressure. So as far as capillary refill goes, um, you know, you'll be uh, going through the skills modules and ATI and, and looking at these assessment pieces and in shadow health, um, all these assessment pieces. But here's the basic. So let me unshare this screen for a minute. So here is, oops, I've got my, okay, mirrored now. So if I was going to check capillary refill, places I generally check this uh, to assess blood flow would be fingers and toes. Uh, now, any place that you press and it lightens up and then the, because you've forced the blood out of the capillaries closest to the skin, um, it blanches out and then the color returns. You can see that a little bit on there. Let me see if I can do that again. And it doesn't show, well, uh, the light's weird in here, but man, this is a not a very expensive uh, laptop. So yeah, the camera's a little off, but try this on yourself. Take your thumb and take your, Okay, this is a little weird. Right? Squeeze, and then look at the nail bed. You'll see that where you've squeezed it down, it turned pale, and then it began to regain color. So when you've done that, uh, you have checked capillary refill, and what you do when you squeeze when you're checking cap refill is you squeeze it, and then count and see how many seconds it is it takes for that to refill. Um, my case, my blood flows pretty good. I'm uh, less than one second for full color to return. Um, in general, you want your capillary refill on your patient that you're assessing to be less than three seconds. If it is greater than three seconds, then you have impaired blood flow to that area, and it's time to start getting nervous. All right, let's go back to the You've seen my face up close and personal enough for a couple of minutes. I own a mirror. I know what kind of a horror show that is. There we go. So, slow cap refill. I said. There we go. So. Amputations. So a surgical amputation. Now, the difference between uh, surgical and traumatic amputation, uh, surgical is on purpose. Um, whether or not it was uh, intended, surgical is on purpose. Uh, so traumatic amputation uh, is just that. It was done by forces that, uh, that were not uh, sharp. Um, tends to be a lot more tissue damaged and destroyed. Um, so your types of surgical amputations, below the elbow amputation, hmm. I wonder where that would be, anywhere below here, it could be one inch BEA, all the way to right there at the wrist, okay, so it's the forearm and any part of the so the forearm and any part of the upper arm. So if it comes up 
above the joint than it is above the elbow amputation. Weirdly enough, it's kind of in the name, right? So using those same guidelines, uh, where would a below the knee amputation be or an above the knee amputation? Okay. Uh, take a moment to talk about phantom limb pain. Uh, this is uh, one of the creepier, weirder things that uh, that happens to the human body. Uh, phantom limb pain. Phantom limb pain is actual pain. This is where the patient uh, is feeling pain in a limb that no longer exists. How's that work? Remember, pain is not felt. Okay, I didn't feel the pain right here. Okay, actually, I didn't feel much pain at all, but I didn't feel the pain right here. The nerves that registered the painful stimulus were triggered from here. Where I felt the pain was up here. So in that case of the patient who uh, who was, well, one of my patients who will rename, remain nameless to uh, you know, protect the innocent and follow HIPAA and all the rest of this. Um, he was a uh, rather crusty old codger and sort of a smart Alec. Um, I came in to take over his care and he says, man, my right foot is just absolutely killing, killing me. Can you look at that? So being the good nurse that I am, okay, let's, uh, let's fix this right foot pain. And I flipped back the covers. He was an above the knee amputation on the right. And I said, patient name, we'll call him Bob. I said, Bob, where is your right foot? He says, I left it in Vietnam. Okay, great, you're one of those. Uh, but he was actually, he was having real pain. Okay? Because the pain is felt here, not at the site of the injury, uh, which is how nerve blocks work for surgery. They're actually blocking the nerve impulse from the area that, uh, that the surgery is taking place. And uh, the painful acts are still happening, but the nerves are not sending that through that blockade to the brain to be felt. Um, another reason that I find neuro patients to be absolutely creepy. Just gonna, just gonna put that there. Um, prostheses. Uh, we have seen since about 2003, uh, we have seen an amazing bit of development in prosthetics. Um, you know, since the uh, since the invasion of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, um, we have seen some absolutely crazy pieces coming through. That is one silver lining, fortunate side effect of war, I guess, is uh, medical uh, medical research tends to bloom during these times uh, because there are, in the case of prosthetics. There were a lot more uh, people missing limbs. Um, it sucks that uh, that this had to happen, but again, the uh, advances in prosthetics since that time have been nothing short of remarkable. Uh, computerized limbs, uh, research that is uh, now allowing electronic servos to respond to nerve impulses. Um, if any of you are Star Wars fans, uh, you may actually see Luke's hand at some point. Um, and in not uh, that distant future, if the coronavirus doesn't wipe us all out. Um, so stay home, stay safe, stay healthy. Because we need nurses. We need more nurses, which is handy because that's what you're here for, right? Um, if not, 
you got the wrong video. Oh, before I go on to this, um, I'm a sucker for cool things. Uh, and one thing that I have been seeing in the uh, maker communities now, and if you don't know what a maker is, well, Google that because it's actually really pretty cool. They're handy people much like myself who like to build different things. In the maker communities, uh, 3D printing especially, um, we're seeing groups come together that are printing open source prosthetics for kids who are missing a hand or, you know, born without, uh, born without one. And some really, really cool kid designs. Um, that's just little uplifting piece for you here in the midst of all this corona crazy. So continuing with amputations. Okay? Now if we're amputating something, we're doing it for a reason. Okay. Uh, but with the nursing considerations. So preventing complications. All right. Major complication of an amputation. Oh, and I got a new one to introduce you to too. Um, Major complication, infection, um, gangrene, and, uh, and or osteomyelitis. Uh, that's when an infection gets into the bone and then begins to travel up. Um, so nursing, this is a, one of those nursing secrets, okay, nursing school secrets. All right, a surgery is a surgery is a surgery, is a surgery. Huh? What's it, what's, what's it talking about there? Okay. So, don't want anybody else to hear this. Okay, so with surgeries, complications, all right? You got a group of complications or potential complications, things that we need to be on the lookout for that are common to every surgery whether it be a wart removal um, okay that may be a little extreme because unless it's a big wart okay to open heart surgery all right so here they are i'm gonna list these off as you go through this program and you are taking my classes or taking the med surge classes i want you to remember these things so with any surgery a surgery is a surgery is a surgery, right? Just like scar tissue is great at being scar tissue, but it isn't great at being anything else. A surgery is a surgery is a surgery. Common to all surgeries, you have the potential for pain. Okay, there's number one. Okay. What's number two? Hemorrhage. Because it's a surgery, you're cutting in. Okay. So pain, hemorrhage. Number three. Infection. Okay. Pain, hemorrhage, infection. Number four, anesthesia complications. Because with a surgery, the likelihood, and unless they're, you know, super badass, um, is that there's going to be anesthesia. All right. So we have pain, hemorrhage, Infection, anesthesia complications. The last one, and I want you to become very, very familiar with these processes. Okay, go through your books. There's actually a, a really good Khan Academy um, that covers this. Number five, inflammation. Inflammation plays a huge part in a huge number of the conditions that we deal with that we uh, care for patients who are experiencing. So, pain, hemorrhage, anesthesia complications, infection, can be in any order there, and inflammation, right? With any surgery, those are gonna be your basics. Now, then it depends on the type of surgery. If it's a uh, mole removal, 
okay. Those are probably the only things. Well, you have some scarring, and you might have, uh, and you might have some body image disturbance. Okay. If it's an open heart surgery, then you have the potential for hypotension, MI, these other pieces. So those five that I talked about are common to every surgery. The different pieces get those glued into your brain. Okay, it's, you know, with super glue or I don't know, Gorilla Glue, whatever it is you're going to use. Um, but uh, then the other complications of the surgery depend on the type of surgery it is. Yeah? Okay, that's a, that's a foot stomp moment there. Get into that, understand that, understand inflammation. Know that a surgery is a surgery is a surgery. And you've got those five potential complications, right? Back to amputations. Um, client teaching. You might think, well, okay, patient's gone in for surgery. They've had their leg amputated. That's a big thing. They'll probably remember that, right? Not necessarily. Um, how could you forget a thing like that? Consider this. Um, you are, you have been walking around on two legs for 40 years. Um, you are also a, um, my lecture is being interrupted by a cat harking up a hairball. Ay, 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 ay. Uh, working from home is fun. Um, <laughs> so, been walking around on two legs for 40 years. Uh, and then you're non compliant diabetic, you get a wound on your foot, end up with osteomyelitis, have to have the leg amputated or the foot amputated. Okay. You've got 40 years of programming that says, okay, when I get up in the middle of the night because I have to pee, uh, I get up and I walk to the bathroom. Even when I'm half asleep, maybe even while I'm still asleep. Okay, so now you're short a leg. And this is week two since the amputation. And you wake up in the middle of the night because you have to urinate. And you hop out of bed on thinking you're going to be on both feet. Then what happens? You land on one foot. You don't land on the other foot because it's not there anymore. And tip over head first into the ground, uh, get a uh, intracranial bleed, and die before anybody finds you. That's an extreme case, but uh, this this can happen. Or say it's an amputation of an arm. You don't realize the number of times that you actually use your hands um, or your arms for safety. So you're walking down the hallway and you step on a Lego because you've got kids and they have Legos and Legos are hell. Uh, and it causes you to stumble and you reach out to grab the wall to keep yourself from falling over. Except that you no longer have an arm there to reach out and grab the wall to stop yourself from falling over, and then you fall over. So it, these the client teaching, this is going to be a thing, uh, reminding them constantly and teaching them also other ways to uh, um, to adapt, but also to be very mindful of their safety during these initial pieces because it takes a while for your body to remember, oh, hey, I don't have that anymore. That makes sense? Right. Emotional support. Kind of a duh there, right? You've gone in. Uh, I came in with, uh, with two arms and two legs and I'm leaving a foot shorter on one side. Um, okay, that's, that may take an emotional toll. Or I was just fine and just healthy and uh, I got into a car accident and lost an arm or lost a leg, right? There's emotional toll there. Assisting with exercise, right? Um, depending on the amputation, your patient may not uh, be able to exercise as they normally would. Um, 
a case comes to mind of a patient that was in that was admitted to my unit in the hospital uh, who was a uh, a left below the knee amputation and then also had a left sided CVA, so his uh, right side was weak, um, and the patient had to. Well, they were originally scheduled for an exercise stress test, but uh, we kind of raised an eyebrow on that one um, because how's the patient going to run on a treadmill with one leg that doesn't work and the other one that doesn't exist? Um, but we had to provide range of motion and exercise for that patient uh, to keep him from developing contractures. Very important uh, with patients who have become immobile uh, that we prevent the contractures because as they are recovering, um, we want them to have the best chance of being able to um, return to their best possible function. And if we have a contracture where a joint has tightened up and, uh, and kinked up, we have to, because tendons have a tendency to uh, tighten up and shorten when they don't get used, um, we have to go so much further with that patient. That patient has to go so much further that they may not be able to get back to their best level of function. Last piece here, replantation of severed limbs. Okay, we'd be talking really about, um, uh, about traumatic amputations here. Generally, if we're doing a surgical amputation, there's a reason for it. It's probably not going to be uh, re-implanted. Uh, the difference being uh, transplanting a toe in place of a thumb for patients. Really cool surgery. Uh, there's lots of uh, lots of YouTubes out there, uh, or there were anyway, uh, about uh, patients who have sacrificed their big toe to give themselves a thumb so that they can continue to um, to function more normally with their hands. All right, common treatments. Application of heat and cold. Uh, if you've ever had a sprained ankle with an ice pack on it, you understand how this, uh, how this works um, or why we do this. You may understand why we do this. Um, heat and cold, through baths and soaks, compresses, uh, paraffin baths when I was going through hand therapy that was one of my favorite things ever because it dipped your hand in uh, in melted wax and you sort of made a candle out of your hand but the heat went all the way through and it was just a wonderful thing and your skin was all nice and soft as well um, wow that just came out of my mouth uh, so with these now why would we want to get heat going Think about what happens to blood flow when you are hot versus when you're cold. Um, kid has a fever, or maybe you have a fever. Maybe you're one of those that really shows it. Uh, you know, pale skin, tans under a desk lamp, get a fever, and your face flushes. Okay, you're not embarrassed. You don't feel good. You've got a fever going. What's happening there is with that increased heat, the capillaries near the surface of the skin and in those tissues are opening up to increase blood flow. Now what's happening with the fever is that increased blood flow is able to radiate heat off through the surface of the skin, thereby helping to lower your body temperature. Where we're applying heat, it's having that same effect. It is opening up the blood flow because for your body to repair itself, it has to get those pieces like proteins, uh, like glucose for power, uh, to power the cell's functions, uh, like oxygen, has to get those pieces to the site of the injury. So providing that heat actually causes a little inflammation, but it opens up the blood flow to those areas. Cold packs. You have pain, you have swelling, you apply cold packs. It causes those vessels to constrict, reducing blood flow and reducing the inflammation in the edema. Um, because pain 
can cause inflammation as the inflammatory response is your body is responding to this insult that it's had. But inflammation also causes pain. Um, so we would be doing hot or cold, depending on what we're trying to accomplish for that patient. If we're trying to reduce swelling, cold packs. If we're trying to promote blood flow for healing, warm packs. Um, and it may be uh, also alternating warm and cold. Increase the blood flow to the area for healing and then uh, swapping off to cold packs to reduce the inflammation. Physical therapy, providing passive range of motion. That means we are moving everything for them. I've already begun to talk about passive range of motion with exercise being so very important. Uh, because if those joints tense up and your patient now has a fist that you have to pry open against all of that tension, if we are providing passive range of motion for that impaired limb uh, from the start, the contracture doesn't develop. The contracture doesn't develop, the patient has a better chance of regain as, as much function as I can. Active range of motion, we're guiding the patient through that. And that is instead of us lifting the arm and straightening and bending, we're talking the patient through that, you know, getting the patient to do it. Moving all the fingers and the wrist and, right, and then bend the elbow, raise the shoulder, don't forget the head and neck, Ooh, that crunch. Um, all these pieces, that's active range of motion. The patient is actually doing it. Faster range of motion, we're doing it for them. Massage, uh, another way to promote blood flow and healing. Okay. External immobilization devices, another common uh, treatment. So, sprained an ankle, sprained it bad. Now in a, in, a, uh, in a wrap or a brace to provide support to that ankle while it's healing. Or I have damaged my wrist. I'm now wearing a brace to help support that joint to maximize healing time and minimize further damage, right? Splints, casts um, for musculoskeletal injuries. And the last piece is traction, right? So uh, weight being applied through a pulley system to, in most cases, there are different kinds of traction, um, to actually pull the damaged area, bone generally, damaged area apart and keep it in alignment. Um, traction is really kind of cool and the main thing I want you to know about traction from uh, from this standpoint is if you are caring for a patient with traction who is in traction and you do not know all about the type of traction that they're in you do not mess with the traction you get the person that is trained with the type of traction to teach you and to take care of the traction on that patient uh, because you can do a lot of damage by mismanaging traction uh, one piece there are, uh, you have seen there's a couple of examples in the book one of them being skeletal traction um, so a couple of things that uh, that you might not uh, realize our traction. Um, if you've seen a halo device, a person has broken their neck, and they've got the shoulder harness and the ring around, and the rods coming up, and the screws drilled into their skull, holding everything uh, in alignment. There's traction. Um, or the patient who has had a uh, fracture of a limb um, and has this kind of crazy, there's a ring here and a ring here with bolts going in through the skin into the bone and bars in between them. That is another type of traction. Um, 
the thing to remember with those is when you are moving that limb. So I've got this on here, right? I'm not going to move the limb from here. I'm not going to move the limb from here okay? because what I'm doing at that point is I am causing torque on this break in here. When you move a patient who has a skeletal traction on, it's called an external fixator. You grab the cage and move the limb with the cage. That way you're not disturbing the ends of the bone. Um, that's that's all the deeper I'm going to go into that right now. It's uh, cause, because traction, if you are not trained in it, get trained. Um, get the person who is trained to, uh, to train you. All right. Chronic back pain. Time for a bunny trail. Not really a bunny trail. Okay. You're going to be nurses. Evidently, you're going to be nurses because, uh, well, you're in nursing school. Okay, back pain is really, really common with nurses. Really common. Um, so osteoarthritis, spinal stenosis, intervertebral disc problems. Uh, the reason that these are so common in nursing is because we lift, bend, pull, push, do CPR, run, uh, don't raise the bed when we're caring for our patients. Uh, these, all these things put stresses on lower back. Um, there's a piece called, uh, the, the locals here call nurses back. And that is uh, dysfunction at uh, between L4 and S1, lumbar to the top of the sacrum. Call it nurse's back because so many nurses have damage in those areas, have chronic back pain. How do we prevent that as nurses? Lift properly. Maintain good body mechanics and raise the bloody bed. Don't forget to put it down when you're done, but raise the bed when you're caring for your patient. And if you have to lift somebody, try to only lift with somebody that's the same height as you. Because otherwise, uh, somebody's down in a, in a kung fu uh, horse stance and the other one's on their tiptoes trying to get the lifting forces equal and somebody's going to get hurt that way too. Um, Lordosis, kyphosis, scoliosis. So you've got uh, swayback, hunchback, and then the uh, sideways curvature of the spine. Intervertebral disc disease, the discs. So with your vertebrae, it, the space between each vertebrae is a joint. You have a lot more joints in your body than you may be thought. Okay. Each one of these has that intervertebral disc. These can become damaged. They can become worn away. They can bulge and uh, impinge on the spinal cord. Okay. Um, this can cause some very extreme back pain and permanent dysfunction if it is not uh, addressed. Um, Numerous people that I know are on chronic medications for pain, uh, even though they've had their back surgeries and the, uh, the area of impingement, the area that was causing irritation to that nerve, has been reduced and relieved, there is still lasting damage. Okay? Um, that's not something that you, uh, if you begin to feel that, that's not something you want to let slide. Right. Um, and then temporomandibular joint disorders, TMJ, were the, were the mandible, that loose joint right there. I just realized I'm not entirely sure if you can see my little face on the corner of the screen. I believe you can. Um, 
So at the temporomandibular joint, um, you've got pain at that point. You've got disorder. It can, uh, it can cause issues with the uh, patient being able to chew, um, patient being able to speak easily, lots of pain. Now, here's a question for you. Uh, you can go ahead and drop this one in the comments, right? Why would a patient with TMJ, why would we need to assess their nutritional intake? Little critical thinking piece for you there. Now let's kick into degenerative disorders. Move my picture up here a little bit. Okay. Muscular, mu been a busy week. Muscular dystrophies, chronic degenerative skeletal muscle disease. Start out every, you know, start out life and they're fine, but as things progress, it's a chronic disease. It's not going away. Skeletal muscles uh, begin to uh, become damaged. They get smaller. They're not functional. Okay. It's a chronic, there's no cure as of yet. Um, exercise and splinting can help. Uh, prevent deformities and delay um, dysfunction. Right? Um, special braces for ambulation, leg braces, um, and often the the double canes. Uh, um, Walter White's son in uh, Breaking Bad with the leg braces and the two canes, muscular dystrophy. Um, so. We want to teach our clients, weirdly enough. Um, that is the other thing we do besides collect data, make plans, and, and assess how our plans work, is we do a lot of teaching. A lot of teaching. Um, that's our next biggest job. You thought, oh, well, you know, putting in IVs and catheters and, uh, and giving medications was our biggest job. No. No, our, uh, with the patient education and the assessment pieces, those are bigger chunks of our lives than, than passing a pill, okay? Uh, because with education, we have the potential to change the patient's, uh, um, their outlook, their life. We can change it so that they don't come back again for the same thing. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but we keep going. Patient education, right? So with patient education, we want them to prevent upper respiratory infections because upper respiratory infections can become lower respiratory infections. And lower respiratory infections can become, well, as the clinical term is dead, okay? Lower respiratory infection, develop pneumonia, Patient can't exchange uh, CO2 for oxygen. Patient dies, um, and it can all start with an with a URI, an upper respiratory infection. Okay, one of the issues with muscular dystrophy, muscular dystrophy, is this is a, a degenerative disease of skeletal muscles, and uh, when you're coughing, you're not just using your diaphragm. Right, you're not just using your intercostal muscles. You're using your abdominals or uh, your skeletal muscle, and uh, to be able to cough effectively, you need good skeletal muscle. And if you have muscular dystrophy, you may not be able to cough as effectively, which then increases your risk for developing pneumonia by not being able to clear secretions. Make sense? Uh, maintaining ideal weight, right, for these patients because, well, they have enough to work against uh, where uh, being overweight uh, or underweight um, 
puts further stresses on the body that they already have stresses from the muscular dystrophy and good general health. The longer they can maintain good general health, the longer they can maintain uh, the majority of their function. I have a lot of screens around me here and things are flashing. Um, so repetitive strain injuries, right? Carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, so you got the median nerve and the wrist. Um, see this a lot in uh, data entry types. Um, we used to call them secretaries, but uh, that's not accurate anymore. Um, but uh, the nerve that feeds the hand, uh, the median nerve, there is stenosis around that, puts pressure on that, and then you have pain and dysfunction. Um, lateral epicondylitis, um, chicken pluckers disease. Repeated forceful wrist and finger mu uh, muscle or finger movements um, from plucking chickens. That was uh, that was how I was first introduced to it. Um, however, uh, think about other things that are causing repeated and forceful wrist and finger movements. Uh, there's a big potential for Xbox injuries here. Yeah, esports are actually dangerous. Who knew? Um, and then rotator cuff injury. Uh, so with throwing motions or lifting motions, the shoulder itself can become damaged. Um, that ends a lot of baseball careers, pitcher careers. Oh, inflammatory disorders. Inflammation, huh? Did I mention that already? I think I did. I think I said become very familiar with the processes for inflammation, okay? So you can break these down, bursitis, uh, tenosynovitis. Um, but let's look at our old friend, arthritis, okay? Arthro, joint, right? So did you know that there are over 100 different types of arthritic disorders? Uh, which is including rheumatoid arthritis, which is uh, due to autoimmune factors. Body is attacking uh, is attacking the joints and cells. Um, but uh, osteoarthritis, that's what we most commonly see, uh, or degenerative joint disease. This generally affects the weight-bearing joints. Okay hips, knees, ankles, or elbow, wrist. And if you are a person that uses your hands a lot, it can affect hands as well. It's repeated stress on those joints causing, uh, causing damage, okay? And then with that, then you get inflammation of the joint because you have damage. Your body is responding to that by inflammation trying to heal the damage um, and then you have the pain on top of that okay ankylosing spondylitis think of this as uh, rheumatoid arthritis so autoimmune body is attacking the uh, the joints but of the spine um, this is uh, crippling really crippling what do you think True or false? Arthritis can interfere with the client's ability to perform activities of daily living. Those of us that have arthritis don't get to answer this one because we already know. What do you think? True or false? If you said true, you are right. Okay. Uh, basic activities of daily living. The pain, the uh, impairment of joint mobility can really cause uh, some issues with this. Now, does that mean that your patient uh, or your client um, has no more life? No, they um, learn new techniques uh, to accomplish ADLs and uh, hopefully, anyway, 
and maintain a uh, a much better quality of life for longer. Okay. So let's look at RA versus OA. My face keeps getting in the way. Rheumatoid arthritis versus osteoarthritis. All right, so RA systemic, meaning it's uh, it can be anywhere. This is the immune system attacking, it's autoimmune, immune system is attacking the tissues. Osteoarthritis, not systemic. Generally, uh, uh, to one or uh, two areas, joints, All right? RA can cause inflammation throughout the body. Um, OA, inflammation is local. RA may have uh, swelling fingers. Uh, OA, the joints don't necessarily have. Now we've talked about the inflammatory process. The inflammatory process is happening, but you won't uh, you won't all the time or often see those joints really severely swollen. Okay. Um, OA is also the most common type of arthritis where RA is autoimmune. RA generally uh, can start um, affecting young adults where OA generally. Now, if you're a person who has uh, who has lived a really rough, rough life, rough life, uh, really rough life, um, or who has uh, done a lot of joint damage, that can happen in younger adults as well. But uh, mostly OA, you're talking mid to older adulthood. Okay. RA, small and large, uh, doesn't much care. Um, OA, the weight-bearing joints and knuckles because of all the movement and forces. You don't realize how much force you actually put on things with your hands when you're gripping until you're unable to do so. RA, surgery is not going to really do anything because this is an immune response and autoimmune disease. Um, OA, you can get joint replacements or fusions um, that can uh, reduce or, in some cases, eliminate the pain. Um, very often, you'll find hip and knee patients who, right after surgery, um, will uh, will tell you that yes, they hurt, but the post-surgical pain from having that joint lopped off and uh, metal chunks hammered and screwed into the ends of the bones and everything stitched back together. It's not a gentle surgery. Um, the, but the pain from that is actually less than what they lived with, with the damaged joint. All right. So musculoskeletal manifestations of systemic disorders, gout. Right, that's number one there, uh, can be controlled, right, with diet and medications. Um, gout, you get uh, accumulations of uric acid crystals in dependent joints. Now, when we think of crystals, um, they're not shiny, faceted little things. They tend to be spiky accumulations um, that look like glass shards. Um, in a sense, they are ish. Uh, and these accumulate in joints that are dependent, so the lowest joints. So in most people, that's the feet. Um, be very painful. It gets into the large joints of the feet, and uh, it hurts a bunch. Lupus. I got two, discoid uh, and systemic lupus, erythematosus. Um, again, we have autoimmune disease, and uh, these can cause inflammation and dysfunction in several parts of the body, but can have uh, an effect on the musculoskeletal system. Scleroderma, rickets, and osteomalacia. All right, rickets, uh, 
used to be much more common um, and you can see this in lots of pictures of rickettsial children um, and they walk around they're kind of bow-legged and if uh, if you look at images of their uh, weight-bearing bones like their femurs they're curved um, this is a disease primarily of malnutrition they're not getting sufficient calcium, vitamin D. Their bones are softer. So as they are walking and moving and learning to walk, those bones become deformed from holding up the weight. Okay. Osteomalacia, I, again, you've got uh, softened bones, uh, and that can be caused uh, from uh, parathyroid gland issues, um, dietary Again, I mean, these are uh, these used to be most uh, most commonly seen as uh, uh, issues with malnutrition. Trauma, everybody's favorite, right? Sprains and strains. Um, if I were to call up on the class and said, "Who's had a uh, sprained ankle before?" A lot of people would probably raise their hands. The majority of you probably did not have a sprained ankle unless you went to see the doc and he said, yeah, it's sprained, but more likely a strain. Um, where you have a strain is the tissues holding the joint together have been stretched. Maybe some of the fibers have been parted, but they're still, they're still together and it's painful and it swells and, and it's not a lot of fun. A sprain you actually you're getting damaged some of those uh, ligaments that are holding the joint together break um, and uh, it takes much longer to heal from a sprain than it does a strain dislocations uh, the joint itself has been separated uh, pulled apart in a weird place and uh, that joint is no longer working because the joint technically doesn't exist you have two You've got a, a, an upper and lower piece of that joint, but they're not in contact at that point. Um, dislocations, say, uh, is called reducing the dislocation, um, not something we do as nurses, um, not on purpose anyway. Um, but they have to be very careful when a patient is uh, having a dislocation reduced because as that joint is pulled together, remember you also have nerves and blood vessels that run through that area and if a nerve or a blood vessel happen to uh, get in that or on that joint surface as the joint was being reduced as the dislocation was being reduced the ends of that joint come together cut off blood flow so with a dislocation before and after reduction you want to check that the blood flow is intact, distal to the dislocation. Yeah. Fractures. Had one or two. Um, wasn't the smartest when I was younger. Uh, so types of fractions. You got complete, incomplete, closed, and open. So a complete fracture, uh, you have two ends of a bone where you used to have or maybe three or four ends of a bone, depending on how bad it was, uh, where you used to have just one bone. Um, an incomplete fracture, so you have a break coming, but the bone has not completely separated. Um, so you may you have a you have a broken area, you have an instability, but there's still a piece uh, of that bone that is continuous from proximal to distal. Right? Closed fractures. Um, the bone has, the, the skin is intact. Uh, closed fracture, uh, you, know, you have a break, but you can't see bone. If you can see bone without an x-ray, then you have an open or a compound fracture where the end of the bone has come through the surface of the skin. Um, not a fun fracture to have, personal experience. Um, also, if you wonder if a pickup truck and a motorcycle can occupy the same space at the same time, they can't. Ah, see, here we go. So we got a complete, right? we've got an enclosed, 
we've got a compound or open, right? So close, open, right? Complete. Um, I'm pointing at the screen like you're going to be able to see that. So follow my. <laughs> so here we have a uh, what we call it a compression fracture, right? You'll find compression fractures in the spine. Where you are going to find these and why it is so important to keep up with the patient education and never trust your patients. Um, another nursing fact, your patients are lying liars that lie a lot. They will lie straight to your face and sometimes not even realize they're doing it uh, because they just don't know. All kinds of different lies, but if they're telling you wrong information, whether they mean to or not, it's a lie. Anyway, don't trust your patient when you are moving them into the wheelchair because where you, I usually see these, these, these little guys right here where my cursor is swirling around there. These are on your floppers. Okay, those of you who are CNAs know this patient. Um, he or she is 80 years old, ambulates with a wheelchair, can still transfer, um, and goes from the walker to the wheelchair or to the chair. You know, may, may ambulate with a walker, but goes to the chair and when they sit down, they're perfect. They're following instructions until they get about that high, or sometimes that high, off the sur surface of the chair, and then they just drop. And you hear that butt go as they hit the chair. This is where you're going to see this, and you usually see it in, uh, in the uh, lumbar spine. And when we have little old ladies that are doing this, uh, they're postmenopausal. The uh, probability is uh, there's some osteoporosis happening, and they run an even higher risk. Right? Um, this is straight out of your book, so you can review those. The textbook of basic nursing, the big yellow one. All right. So what do we think? Cervical fractures. There are multiple cervixes in the human body. Um, uh, make sure you know which cervix it is that they're talking about before uh, interjecting yourself into the conversation because uh, you might get embarrassed. But in this case, we're talking spinal. We're talking the neck. All right, so cervical fractures, C1 to C4, can be immediately life-threatening. True or false? If you said true, you would be correct. All right. The nerves that run your diaphragm, the nerve that runs your diaphragm, that allows you to breathe, exits the spinal column here. If you have a fracture that transects that nerve, you don't breathe. Um, Superman. Okay, I may be dating myself here because uh, some of my younger students may not know who Christopher Reed is, right? Superman uh, fell off a horse. Kryptonite did not kill Superman. Actually, a bed sore killed Superman, but you know, we'll, we'll go with this. Fell off a horse, hit the ground, broke his neck, um, ended up ventilator dependent because the nerve that in his diaphragm stimulated his diaphragm to breathe was transected so yes even superman can be taken out with a uh, c1 to c4 especially c12 right there at the uh, at the very top that's uh, pretty much instantly dead unless you've got a ventilator handy all right so trauma care splints in the uh, in the initial phase, patients laying there with a uh, with a broken leg. Well, we don't want to just pick them up and move them without stabilizing that broken area. Because if I have two ends of bone that are all busted up and they look kind of like this, and they're all sharp, and I'm moving that patient, I've got Edward freaking scissor hands going. Uh, 
inside that uh, inside that leg. And oh boy, Edward Scissorhands. Okay, y'all got to know that one. Um, I have all these sharp edges uh, slashing around, and I have some very large vessels that also run next to these big long bones. Those sharp edges can pierce those vessels and uh, cause the patient to bleed profusely and die. So we put splints on. A couple of boards. There's all kinds of real crazy ones. Uh, fourth term, I think, uh, we'll go in through some more emergency care pieces. Um, but uh, with the splint, okay, once it's on, get that broken and you don't straighten it out before you splint it. You splint it in place and uh, and let those with more initials behind their names and uh, a surgical suite square the rest of that away. Just going to put that out there. Uh, so you splint it in place. And once you've got it nice and stabilized and splint it in, in place, what do you have to check? I just put a splint on. What do I need to check? I probably want to check and see that I have good blood flow distal to the splint. Because if not, I may save their broken leg, but cost them a foot. Casts. Uh, plaster. I'm actually seeing far fewer plaster casts now than synthetics because plaster, if it gets wet, um, it's really no longer a cast. It's a, sort of a ace wrap with mud on it. Whereas the synthetic casts can uh, can maintain their shape much better after getting wet. They're also lighter, come in prettier colors, um, and a little easier to, to apply. Definitely, definitely cleaner to apply. When you're caring for clients in casts, right? Really important with the patient teaching. Because a cast on an arm or on a leg for an extended period of time, there's going to be some funk buildup under that and it's going to get itchy. And your patient's going to want to try to scratch it. We don't want them to stick anything down that cast to scratch that itch. Not a fork, not a clothes hanger, um, you know, a bottle brush. Don't do it um, because the reason they're itchy is because they've got some funk buildup underneath the cast. Well, what is all in all that funk buildup? That would be the medical term, by the way, funk buildup. Um, you have bacteria, and then you go taking something with a uh, sharp, scratchy edge and running that up and down the skin to, uh, to make the itch stop, and you open up a portal for infection in the middle of a whole bunch of bacteria. See where we're going with this? So that's going to be some patient teaching there. Cast removal. Um, when the cast comes off, it's really actually pretty simple to uh, to remove the cast, I cut through the outer, uh, and it looks like they're using this funny looking circular saw that uh, that is just going to cut right through that. The blade does not spin. Okay, just so you know. Teach your patients this: the blade doesn't spin; it vibrates and fractures the uh, the synthetic fibers in the cast. Even knowing that, for myself, I still flinched when they uh, when they started to cut the cast off of my leg. Even knowing that it doesn't spin, because it looks like a circular saw. Um, your patient may be a little freaked out. Provide some emotional support. Provide some education. Right. Uh, like G.I. Joe says, knowing is half the battle. Traction. So with skin traction, now I'm going to let you research all of these. Uh, just remember that when you're talking traction, if you don't know how to manage the traction, you don't mess with the traction. Okay. If you haven't gotten the training, you really don't want to mess with that. A um, couple of... Uh, couple of points here uh, and, you know, skeletal traction right external fixators um, ORIF open reduction internal fixation 
pretty common orthopedic injury, uh, you know, fracture repair, open reduction. Go into surgery, they cut the area open, wire, pin, staple the bone back together in alignment, close you back up again. ORIF, pretty common. Again, surgery is a surgery is a surgery, right? Hemorrhage, infection, inflammation, pain. That's uh, number five. Put it in the comments. All right. So you got an ORIF. There's a lot. Uh, there's a lot going on there. It hurts. It hurts a lot. And there is a potential for the inflammation coming uh, from that ORIF um, to impair other blood flow. Hip fractures, uh, far too common. Although, I mean, for me, it keeps my mortgage paid. So, uh, no, that's, that's wrong. That's very wrong. Uh, but very common. Uh, actually, relatively simple fix in most cases. Um, well, relatively simple in the fact that cutting off the end of the femur and replacing it with a piece of metal and some plastic and uh, possibly doing the uh, socket in the pelvis as well. Um, if that's simple, then yes, relatively simple fix. Complications. Neurovascular pressure. Okay. Neurovascular. Pressure on the nerves, pressure on the vessels. Pain and nerve damage, tissue death. Okay. Wound infections. Okay. Well, a uh, surgery is a surgery is a surgery. Surgical site infections. Osteomyelitis, where the infection has gotten into the bone. Um, generally, when the infection has gotten into the bone, uh, we begin to talk about amputation time um, or removal of the infected bone because it's very, 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 very difficult to treat that infection and it can keep spreading. Um, and then create a, uh, a condition where the patient just can no longer live. Uh, medical term for that would be death. Right. Uh, and then pneumonia and atelectasis. Oh, we just talked about this, I swear, like it, towards the beginning of this video. Atelectasis, the collapsed lung, the patient's not up and moving, so their lungs are not inflating as they normally would. Reduces real estate available for gas exchange, which you gotta get oxygen in and the CO2 out to keep your cells functioning, right? Hypostatic, so you're not breathing deep, you're not coughing, you're not clearing the secretions. This is why with surgeries, we do these awful horrible things to our patients. We make them deep breathe, including open heart surgeries where they've split the sternum in half, jacked it open and uh, redid the plumbing and wired everything back together, actual wire, wired everything back together, stitched them up. And then when they come into, uh, into day two of recovery, the mean nurses uh, there are saying, okay, now I want you to take some really deep breaths for me and then cough. Okay. Sternum wired together, edges still kind of grating a little bit, and then we're telling the patient to cough. The reason is we don't want them to develop pneumonia um, because they're already pretty well impaired because they've just had an open heart surgery. Um, but it can be quite painful, and then we teach them things like how to splint to uh, make the cough bearable. Um, this is also the point where we introduce them to one of my favorite pieces of kit that our patients completely forget how to use 10 seconds after we've taught them, and that's the incentive spirometer. Um, you've got some ATI on that one. Uh, I, won't, uh, I won't spoil it, but uh, the incentive spirometer is actually one of my uh, favorite pieces of medical equipment that every patient gets, just because it can help prevent pneumonia. 
and then they can go home and I get to see a new face come into the bed. It's not that I didn't like that previous patient. It's like, okay, I've taken care of you long enough. It's time for somebody new. Uh, with fractures, emboli, right? So here's a uh, question for you. What is the difference between a pulmonary embolus, a uh, cerebral embolus, and a coronary embolus? Location. In this case, uh, you have an embolus, which is a chunk of something. It could be a clot. It could be a piece of fat that has gotten in the bloodstream, and it has floated through, and it has gotten wedged in the lung. Okay, so location, location, location. Pulmonary embolus tells you right where it's at. Um, with especially with uh, big long bone femur fractures, fat embolus is a big risk for these patients. Uh, deep vein thrombosis. If you're not up and moving, blood has a tendency to pool. Blood, when it pools, because it's not you know really moving very fast and it's just kind of hanging out. When it pools, it clots. And then when it clots, it becomes a thrombus and can, uh, if it stays in place, it's concerning, but not a horror show. If it doesn't stay in place, then it rolls along with the flow of blood and wedges in a smaller vessel somewhere. In the case of a deep vein thrombosis, it's going to end up in your lungs, um, causing a pulmonary embolus or a PE. Um, PEs can be fatal. Complications of trauma, you could get hemorrhage. Right? Um, okay, if you're hit by the truck and the skin is torn open, you're gonna hemorrhage. Also, if you use up all of your platelets uh, stopping the small bleeds, you have nothing left now to uh, stop the larger bleeds and there's a potential for hemorrhage. Compartment syndrome talked about uh, began to talk about this earlier so let's say I have a fracture here right right there okay it's a closed fracture now my body has registered this as a pretty big insult it doesn't like it and it triggers the inflammatory response locally because it's trying to speed everything there to pick up the healing but what happens is the inflammation starts and I only have so much room to stretch before I run out of I run out of stretching. Now if I'm still being triggered to have the inflammation there and the inflammation inflammation is increasing it begins to put pressure on the other structures in the limb, such as nervous and vascular. Um, in this case, the inflammation can get so bad that it can shut down blood flow, cause nerve damage, uh, and potentially the loss of the limb. So how do we treat that? Well, it's called a fasciotomy. Um, the surgeon goes in and takes a very sharp knife called a scalpel, and cuts a slice down the arm and then leaves it open so that the tissues underneath can't have a place to expand to so and it reduces the pressure on the vasculature and the nerves okay um, other complications I actually think we've hit them all thus far so common surgical treatments for uh, for traumas okay fractures. Well, then you'd have the ORIF or uh, or a closed reduction and splinting. Okay, ligament ruptures, like a sprain. Okay, um, arthritic joints. And that's a trauma. In the common surgical treatments for an arthritic joint, we may look at um, uh, we we may look at a joint replacement for that joint. Um, Accidental limb amputation, um, we want to try to put that back on. Okay. Um, 
ligament ruptures, going in and repairing the ligaments. And these are not heavily vascularized structures. So the recovery time is actually longer than you might think. Um, because for healing, you, you really need good blood flow and they're not heavily vascularized. So the components getting there, it takes a while. Um, ligament and tendon ruptures uh, are um, really difficult to, difficult to repair and uh, keep movement. A lot of physical therapy involved afterwards. Um, joint replacements or arthroplasties. Um, we may have amputations, as we've talked about before. Um, and then spinal cord injuries or spinal column injuries, not spinal cord. The spinal column provides support. The spinal cord provides communication from the brain to everywhere else. Uh, the spinal cord writes to the outside, uh, to the uh, posterior surface of the spinal column, surrounded by um, the, uh, the structures of the vertebrae that protect it. Okay. Uh, so, might have a fracture or degenerative disc disease. Um, so surgical procedures to fix that, or you have stenosis uh, bone growth around the spinal cord, which is causing pressure, uh, in which case we uh, would go in, um, the surgeons would go in, not we, um, the surgeon would go in and actually clip that bone away that's putting pressure on the spinal cord to reduce the pressure or relieve the pressure and uh, um, relieve the pain. Fingers crossed, happy thoughts, they got to it soon enough. Getting towards the end here, neoplasms. All right, common neoplasms, tu neoplasms, tumors, okay? Um, so bone tumors, primary starts in the bone, could be benign or malignant. Uh, it could spread elsewhere. Metastatic tumors, the cancer started elsewhere and traveled to the bone. Um, you won't find a benign metast metastatic tumor. Okay. Um, that uh, cancer has, uh, has gone on, it has metastasized, it has spread to other parts of the body uh, into the bone. That, that is that. Um, I hope you have learned something and my voice hasn't driven you absolutely completely bonkers. So with that, I'm going to uh, get this converted, uh, get it posted and get you a link. Happy Wednesday. <laughs>